Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Switch webinar series, this time with Nuvi. Um, our topic today is VTT rollout in local markets. Uh, before we go into the introduction, just a short um, intro to this uh, webinar software here. And for those who haven't joined the previous webinars, um, you see on the right hand side the chat box. It would be great if you could uh, just type in where you're joining from. That's always very interesting for us. Um, please note we have a dedicated Q&A uh, session in the end of this webinar. And at the bottom you have right next to the chat box, um, you have a field called ask a question or a button called ask a question. Um, there we would like you to place your questions so we can then um, return to these questions in the Q&A session at the very end. Everyone has also uh, the opportunity to upvote the question that they are interested in most. So we are answering those questions that are um, most relevant for everyone. Um, what else is there to say? Um, I think that's it for the intro. You will be able to um, watch the recording of this webinar using the same link right after the webinar is finished as well. So what do we have here? Um, I see London, I see uh, Copenhagen, Hayan, I see Amsterdam, Vermont, Valencia, Warsaw, Seoul, Cologne, California, Frankfurt. Mike's uh, nice, all over the planet. That's how we like it. Perfect. So, um, I'm Mark, I'm the CEO and founder of Switch. And with me here um, in this webinar from the Switch side is also Adam. Uh, he is our Chief Product Officer at Switch. Hi, Adam. And uh, we also have our dear friends from Nube, um, Hamza, who is the Director of Embedded Solutions at Nube, and also Path, who is um, the Product Manager for the V2X Solutions. All right. Um, we will start with an introduction into Nuve, so I will hand over to Path or Hamza, who is going to take this part. Uh, we, <clears throat> we hardly hear you, I think, Hamza, or is it just me? No, I'm having the same issue, Mark. Maybe it's the airport's tricking. <laughs> Is it better now? There we yes, go. we're better. Yeah. So I was saying that Nuvi is a green tech company based in San Diego. We're deploying the V2G concept that was uh, developed by Willett Kempton, our co-founder and professor at the University of Delaware back in 1996. What V2G does is uh, allowing bi-directional charging by giving energy back to the grid when there is peak consumption or grid disruptions. And that helps stabilize the grid and allow the end user to see potential grid revenues. We were officially formed in 2010 and we offer a gift platform, which is an aggregator platform that works with multiple EVSEs and several OEMs around the world. So as of today, we have over 16 megawatts under management across three continents. We come with 25 years of R&D in V2G. and have been running V2G in Denmark for over five years, providing service called FCRN. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Our HQ is in San Diego with offices in Delaware, London, the UK, Copenhagen. And I'll pass it on to Part, who, who's going to dig into the different use cases and personas. Thanks, Hamza. And good morning, good afternoon, all. So I'll first start with the interesting topic of vehicle to grid use cases. So as the world moves towards electrification, there is need for a strategic solution that intelligently manages and optimizes the integration of these EVs into the grid. Now, Nuvi sits at this intersection of this new energy and transportation ecosystem and has been trailblazing for years. 
So V2G brings value for all the key personas within this new ecosystem, whether it is the EV owners, the managers, the utilities, the OEMs, charging infrastructure providers, and many more. Now we have deployed our technology globally, as you can see from the pictures, and we are con constantly unlocking benefits for our customers and partners. Uh, primarily in the US, we are enabling school districts and utilities to accelerate the electrification of school bus fleets. We have deployments across the US, and you'll find some of those deployment pictures in the slide, like El Cajon and Concord in California, Durango in Colorado, Pekin in Illinois, and White Plains in New York. In Europe, we've been deploying our solution with light and medium duty commercial fleets. And you'll find some of those pictures as well uh, from our deployments, such as in the UK, Denmark, and Portugal. Now, these deployments are accessing various energy markets and providing different services that are bringing value to customers in the form of savings, as well as revenue opportunities from the grid. Moving on. So I'd, I'd like to highlight this interesting customer story. It is our longest running deployment in Denmark. We call Denmark the birthplace of commercial V2G. And this commercial fleet of 43 EVs owned by a municipal water and gas company in Denmark. So by using our V2G technology, these EVs are turned into grid assets that are providing frequency containment reserve services in Denmark. So with the provision of FCR services, we are able to extract additional revenue for customers, which help lower the total cost of EV ownership. Additionally, we are able to support grid during frequency imbalance scenarios for an easier integration of renewables into the grid. Moving on. Now in the US, electrification of school bus fleets is a perfect use case for vehicle to grid technology. It is the largest mass transit fleet in the US. Also, the utilization rate is low and the routes are constant and consistent with known energy needs. Now, by using Nuvi's V2G uh, platform, what these fleeced customers can do is they can realize the cost benefits as well as they can offset their upfront costs by setting up the charging infrastructure, which has been proven to be one of their biggest barrier to electrification. Uh, these school districts are leveraging Nuvi's V2G technology as it is bringing a cleaner and positive impact on the students, the community, and the environment. Now, when you think about a fleet user, so their expectations are simple. They want high uptime for their vehicles and charging stations. They want to ensure that the vehicle is charged and ready for the trip. And they want the ability to remotely monitor and manage their assets. And this is uh, where I feel that the synergy between Switch and Nuvi exists. Our V2G platform ensures that the mobility needs of the customer stays fulfilled, the battery stays healthy, and the customer receives maximum benefits in the form of cost savings and additional revenue opportunity as we provide high value grid services. Now, combining this with the Switch platform, we create a ubiquitous solution for the fleet market. Moving on. Now let's dive into what V2G truly means and why do we say that Nuvi is V2G? So a scenario where there is only one way of charging your EV without consideration of factors like time, rate of charge, etc., is called dumb charging. Now, depending on the rate plan, this type of charging can lead to high incurred energy cost. Then you have smart charging. I'm going to go back. Yeah, thank you. So then you have smart charging where the EV can be dynamically charged by setting the time of charge. And then V1G refers to the ability to dynamically modify the charge rate or the charge time and access the energy markets. Then we have bi directional charging applications like vehicle to building, vehicle to home. In addition to the capabilities of uh, V1G, the bi-directional charging can store and discharge energy back to the load. For example, if the building or home possess solar panels, then excess energy can be stored in the vehicle's battery, and then the energy can be discharged back to the building to manage energy costs. Now, true V2G consists of two additional features. 
So the first one is the aggregation of multiple EVs to form like a virtual power plant. And second is the ability to perform grid services and selling energy back to the grid. Next. Now let's look at the V2G market opportunities. So the advanced capabilities of our V2G platform allows us to provide all levels of vehicle grid integration and maximize benefits through value stacking. Now the market opportunity can be used as either cost saving or revenue generating. So when you look at this pyramid of opportunity, uh, smart charging sits at the top as it brings cost savings through time of use optimization. Uh, for example, if the customer is on a time of use rate plan in which the cost of energy varies between peak of peak hours, sometimes there is partial peak hour as well. So smart charging can help reduce energy bills in this scenario. Now with V1G, EVs can be turned into assets and they can participate in demand response. And V1G offers the ability to dynamically set charge rates based on external signals. Now with behind the meter optimization, such as um, applications like vehicle to building, vehicle to home can be used for demand charge management, as well as to provide emergency backup when the grid faces an outage. Now for V2G, the utility interconnected assets, and this piece is very important. So the utility interconnected assets must be able to respond to grid signals. And V2G can access different markets like ancillary, capacity, energy. And the type of grid services may vary based on the type of market as well as the characteristics of the assets. Next. So as I was mentioning about the interconnection piece, so for the V2G, the assets must be interconnected with the utility. Now, there is no need for interconnection if vehicle will not be discharging. There is also no need for interconnection if the discharge is only uh, gonna be used as a backup generation. And then interconnection will be required if the vehicle discharges when the site load is connected to the grid, whether or not an export or a net export can take place. Now with that, I'll pass the presentation over to Hamza. Yes, so we'll dig into a new V Denmark use case. This is from our fleets that, were, that are operating in Denmark, providing the FCRN service that uh, that part mentioned. We've been operating for over five years now, an average 17 hours of V2G daily for each vehicles. The total energy charge was 1,600 megawatt hours and the total energy discharge was 700 megawatt hours, totaling over 2,000 megawatt hours managed. And you'll see a graph of the different values throughout the years from 2016 to 2021. Next slide, please. So for the Danish use case, we're using 9.5 kilowatt EVSEs on Nissan Leaf EVSE, EVs mainly providing the FCR service. We average $2,000 of revenue per EV per year. However, this revenue is affected by the energy market and vehicles being aggregated. Therefore, the value is not to be taken as a set value. Next slide, please. The battery health question is a recurrent question when it comes to V2G. And the best example we have here is to show actual numbers from our operating fleets. The same fleets that have been generating $2,000 a year on average for the past five years. They've driven around 93,000 kilometers and the average SOH is around 91%. You can find more details on our battery health paper in the website listed there. Next slide, please. I believe this one's for you, Mark. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> um, good. So the question is, now the, this, uh, the things that um, Hamza and Path have been talking about in the past have been made possible through uh, the Shademo standard um which is this japanese um ev charging standard that allows bi-directional charging specifically for dc 
Now, um, Shodimo is specifically relevant in the Japanese market, but less so in other markets like uh, Europe and North America and many other Asian markets, where we have the combined charging system, uh, also known as CCS, um, which is the dominant uh, main communicate or charging interface standard. And the combined charging standard bets on the ISO 15118 protocol, which is the um, industry agreed upon standard between EVs and charging stations to exchange information to manage the charging on a higher level. So what I the, the question I would like to answer for you is, are we able to do vehicle to grid for both AC and DC using the ISO 15118 standard? And uh, also the backend communication protocol, which is the open charge point protocol or OCPP, which um, is used between a charger and the backend system that manages those chargers. Next slide, please. So the question is also can we achieve grid compliant V2G? And what does grid compliant actually mean? Oh, just wait one second. Thanks. Um, so the thing is every um, distributed energy resource, that's the terminology for um, you know, solar inverters, but also vehicles that are connected to the grid and can discharge energy. Um, every distributed energy resource or DER um, connected to a public electricity network needs to abide by certain uh, you know, rules and regulations that are called grid codes. And these grid codes, codes are in place to guarantee a stable operation of the electricity grid. Because what you need to understand is that at each point in time, every second throughout the day, the amount of um, electricity or energy produced, you know, electricity produced during the day needs to match exactly the um, demand in the grid. So every uh, power plant that is providing or uh, generating electricity uh, needs to match the exact demand of all the households, all the factories and all the vehicles that need to be charged. So in Europe, we have um, this um, uh, 50 Hertz uh, grid. In North America, we have a 60 Hertz grid. And this you know, 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz, this is the um, perfect equilibrium between um, demand, um, production of ele electricity and demand. So, um, and there's this interesting link also you see on a second bullet point, um, mainsfrequency.com, where you can see for the European market um, the exact uh, frequency at this very moment. So these grid codes, what do they actually do? Well, they define um, a specific voltage and a frequency or how you need to react as a DER um, when it comes to um, a slight deviation from the nominal voltage or the nominal frequency. And if it comes to that, then these DERs need to react upon by providing a certain um, active power output or also to, by injecting or consuming what is called reactive power. And in order to better understand what active and reactive power really mean, um, we have this nice analogy with this beer glass here. <clears throat> so, you know, um, this beer glass consists of both the actual beer and the foam on top. So you wouldn't want a beer without the foam. It's kind of stale. Um, you don't really like it. A proper beer needs to have some proper foam on top. But in the end, the foam is not really what gives you the taste or what um, you know satisfies your thirst. But you need the whole package. And this analogy in the electricity network is that the um, what is actually um, measured in the utility grid is the kilovolt ampere, this KVA, with you see on the right on the left side, which is basically divided into what we call reactive power, measured in kilovolt ampere reactive, and kilowatts, real the active power. The only, um, let's say, um, measure here that you would know is kilowatts, because um, you read that on your devices, on your appliances, um, you have heard of it. That's the actual real power. And, but we still need reactive power because that keeps the voltage um, um, in place. If the voltage is out of sync, um, if we have over voltage or under voltage, then we need to do something about this reactive power. And that's what these distributed energy resources need to do and act upon. That's as far as I go into the technicalities here. But I hope you understand um, what I'm trying to say. So um, 
Yes. So the um, the electric vehicle and the charging station combined, they form this distributed energy resource. And um, in the end, the utility operator, they want to provide certain set points to make sure that whatever is connected to the grid and provides energy to the grid is abiding by this grid code. So we need to find a way to communicate this information to the charger and also to the vehicle. Now, there's a slight difference between AC and DC when it comes to bidirectional charging. It is easier to do DC bidirectional charging because um, the difference here is in DC charging, um, you, in both sides, you convert DC power from the EV battery into AC uh, power, which is then um, needed for the grid. But in DC charging, the converter sits inside the charging station, which is stationary. It doesn't move around. Um, it's uh, installed somewhere. So it's easy to implement um, this grid code directly into the charging station and the charging station takes care of everything. Um, that's the easiest way forward. And that's also what we see currently in the market. There's a stronger push for DC beat, um, bi bidirectional charging at the moment because it's just easier. Um, however, um, when it comes to AC bidirectional charging, the um, the inverter sits inside the vehicle. It's called the onboard uh, charger. So now we need to tell the vehicle um, certain information so that the vehicle can provide the electricity and the energy back to the grid in such a way that the utility operator is happy and is not um, punishing you from destabilizing the grid and possibly causing a blackout. We don't want that, of course. Now, in ISO 15118, um, this is luckily um, possible. Um, so we do have the information available um, in ISO 15118 for the vehicle and a charger to exchange necessary information. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about Dash 20. This is not a webinar, um, and I would probably bore a few of you. But um, in case you have heard it, there's this so-called dynamic mode, which basically puts the vehicle into a slave situation, making the charging station being the, the master controlled in the vehicle, which is very important for these fast responding grid services, such as FCR or frequency containment reserve that Pat and Hamza have been talking about. And uh, next slide, please. And one more click. Thanks. <clears throat> Again, don't want to talk, I don't want to go into the detail here, but I just want to give you this kind of Proof point. Um, whereas on the left hand side, we see the old ISO 15 WNET standard, or not the old, but the one that's coming to market now, but that has been published in 2014. On the right hand side, we see ISO 15 WNET 20 as it was published in April this year. And dash 20 provides everything that dash, dash 2 provides, like AC and DC charging, but also bi directional charging for AC and for DC. So as opposed to Shademo, which can only do bi-directional charging for DC, here we can do bi-directional charging for AC and for DC. Um, and we also have more services such as wireless charging and pantograph charging, but I uh, don't wanna go into that detail too much. Next slide, please. And one more, yeah, okay, that's good. <clears throat> um, again, don't be overwhelmed by the detail here. Um, maybe if you could click one more time for this animation. Yes, thanks. I want to um, uh, steer your attention to the right side. This is a specific service that is explained in ISO 15118 that is called AC BPT service. AC for AC charging and BPT for bidirectional power transfer. What you see here on the right, it's in all the parameters that can be exchanged between the vehicle and the charging station when the vehicle is asking for all the services that the charging station is offering. And in the lower hand side, you see specifically the parameters that are interesting for the bidirectionality of this service. For example, um, is this building that the vehicle is connected to when we're talking about a, a wall box charger, for example, is this building connected to the grid? Or do we have a, a, a kind of a blackout situation <clears throat> or is this building disconnected from the grid, which means we are in what we call an islanding mode. This means in that case, the vehicle would have to provide the voltage and the frequency um, to create this kind of microgrid. Whereas if the building would be connected to the grid, then we still have frequency and voltage provided by the grid and the vehicle is just providing the, the power, so to say. 
So there, there are all the necessary parameters in place in the 1511.8. Um, but in, on the next slide, you will see in, in a bit more detail and uh, click one more time, thanks, that, um, or a second, one more click, thank you. Um, those are what you see here. I picked out a, one specific message. And that is the message that the charging station is sending to the vehicle while the energy is being transferred, whether it's charging or discharging. We call it the AC charge loop response. This is this case. So during the charging loop, meaning while the car and the charging station are exchanging energy, there are requests and responses going back and forth in a very tight loop, I think every 500 milliseconds. And all the information we need from the charging station to be communicated to the vehicle is what is the target frequency for from the grid operator sides of you? What is the target active power and what is the target reactive power? And that then um, communicated for the different phases, phase one, L1, L2, and L3. So in conjunction now, the EV and the charging station, they have all the information they need to really provide AC bidirectional charging in a grid compliant way. And there are certain, um, when you dig deeper into this topic, there are certain um, uh, you know, tables that the utility operator wants you to follow or certain um, curves. One is called the frequency watt curve, meaning um, we will see also on the different slide, but bear with me for a second. If the frequency that I mentioned needs to be, let's say in Europe, in a perfect equilibrium at 50 Hertz, once it goes slightly above or slightly below, that means that you have to adjust your power. If the frequency goes above 50 Hertz, that means that we have uh, too little uh, demand in the grid, that we are that the generators are generating so much energy, the frequency goes up and up and up, and this causes a swell problem. So in that case, a newbie's platform would then, as an aggregator, ask all the cars under management to please charge now, um, or maybe increase the current charging power, to then bring the uh, increased frequency down. So this means we provide more active power. And in the reverse case, when there is more demand than is currently generated and we cannot generate more, then we would probably ask the vehicles, please reduce your charging power. Um, in this case, uh, yeah, we have this frequent, depending on the frequency, we have a certain kilowatt or watt values that you can communicate to the vehicle so the vehicle can act accordingly. This is on the, on the let's say, more of a global level, like in Europe, the frequency is the same in each and every country, whether it's Poland, uh, UK, Spain, uh, Germany, wherever, the frequency is always the same. The voltage, however, is very different on the local level. Uh, and here it is more about providing, um, if the voltage is a bit out of the nominal range, um, then it is more about providing the, the reactive power or consuming reactive power depending on if we have too much or too little voltage. And again, you see here on the right-hand side these parameters um, where you set the target, meaning what is what do we need in terms of active and reactive power from the grid, grid side. And if you would see the request, the AC charge loop request message from the vehicle, there you would see that the vehicle would uh, provide its present active and present, uh, its present active and present reactive power. I hope I'm not getting too technical, but I hope you understood the kind of principle here, um, convincing you that we have everything we need uh, to be in place. Next slide, please. Um, I recently came across a really good uh, scientific paper that is um, not too technical, at least um, I found it quite well explained, from um, a couple of people from the Renault group, uh, among them Thomas Tromont, um, whom I know quite well. The title is Providing V2X Services Using ISO 15118 EV Equipped with Onboard Bidirectional Charger. So look for that um, paper online if you're interested. Um, it's really, really well written. It's published in 2018, so it's uh, um, you know four years ago, but it's still quite up to date. Next slide, please. Now, the question is, okay, so we have the grounds covered on the communication link between the vehicle and the charging station, which is ISO 15118. But what about the charging station and the backend management system, um, which is usually covered by 
uh, OCPP, so the Open Chart Point Protocol. So the Open Chart Point Protocol is a de facto standard. It's not an ISO or IEC standard, but it's probably used by 95, if not more percent of uh, chargers or, and charging station management systems out there. Now, the latest version is OCPP 2.0.1. Um, but even that protocol does not yet have a clear stand on um, vehicle to grid functionality. However, the Open Charge Alliance, which is um, developing that protocol, has, um, um, has set up a task force. And this task force is called V2X Task Group. And that is currently working on a uh, document that is adding the functionality needed in OCPP to enable vehicle to grid services or vehicle to home, vehicle to building services, commonly referred to in summary as V2X services. Now, this uh, document is based on OCPP 201, and it will then be included in the next version, OCPP 2.1, which, if I'm not completely mistaken, is, is probably going to be released by the end of this year, or at least in the last quarter. Um, next, please. So um, don't worry, there's no breaking change. This document is building upon the existing messages and the existing data structures. Um, so there's no impact for um, implementations that are working on OCPP 201. Um, you can still use it. It's just adding functionality uh, to enable these V2X use cases. But OCPP 1.6, for example, which is um, probably used by um, all almost all chargers out there still. We are now in a transitioning phase from 1.6 to 201. And we as, at Switch are um, helping there as good as we can. Um, so there's a breaking chain between OCB 1.6 and 2.0.1. So it's not backwards compatible. That's uh, something I wanted to just mention. Um, looking into that document that I just mentioned here, this um, task that what the task group is working on, um, you will see that there are several V2X operation modes mentioned, as you see down here. Uh, charging only or central set point and external set point. The difference here is um, the power set point, so meaning which, which power limit um, to be set at each and every point in time. Not only the limit, but also the actual power that the vehicle shall provide, the active power at each and every time uh, during this charging session. Um, with central set point, this will come for the central charging station management system. With external set point, here you, we, we are talking about um, home energy management system or building energy management system, where the set points might not come through OCPP, but through a different protocol. Um, for example, EEBUS, um, which is um, which I know is used in um, home energy management systems. Uh, central frequency, local frequency, maybe if you could um, click the next animation. Um, here's an example I would like to share. Um, central frequency means that um, the set points, depending on the frequency, are provided from the charging station management system via the OCPV protocol. Local frequency would mean you would have a local device inside a charging station that is measuring the current frequency. And then um, you have stored a, a, a P over F table, as it is called, so a power over frequency table, which means for each and every um, frequency range, um, you have a fixed power value that the uh, charging station or then thereby also the vehicle is supposed to provide. So when we look at this uh, table down here, you see, for example, this element is called V2X power frequency table. This is basically a list of tuples where the first entry is um, referring to the frequency and the second entry is referring to the power. So if the frequency is at 47 hertz, for example, this would be quite critical already. Then here the vehicle would be asked to provide uh, 10 uh, kilowatt in uh, active power to the grid. Or when it's around 49.99, um, hertz or kil kilohertz, then um, the vehicle is asked to just provide 500 uh, watts. And um, when we are around 50 hertz, then you know no um, no frequency containment reserve is needed. Just to kind of explain to you um, how to think about these these grid codes and and how these grid codes look like, because that's exactly the kind of information that you would need 
to send to the charging station or store in a charging station. And the charging station can then act upon and send these target values to the vehicle. Um, yeah, so if you look at the link that you see below this graphic here, um, if you are a member of, of the OCA, you have definitely already access to it. Um, this page, this document is, I think, 95 pages long. So, um, but the, the, the gist of it is explained on the first, I don't know, uh, 15 to 20 pages. Good. I think that's it, what I wanted to tell you. Sorry for the very deep technical dive here, but um, I think it's important for you to understand and to not only get a high level overview of, yeah, this is possible and in general, um, we can make it happen. But for all those of you who are thinking, should I do DC or AC charging? Is AC charging uh, even possible, uh, bidirectional charging? Um, from my point of view, I don't see why it shouldn't be possible. We have everything in place. And um, I would then like to hand over to um, Adam to explain more about the Switch platform. Great, thanks, Mark. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so just building on Mark, Hamza's and Path's points around building out a capability like V2G, which allows you to generate value back from your network through the V2G technology. And what I wanted to do was take you through how at Switch and also uh, with Nuvo through the partnership, how we were building a feature set that which supports the need to bring value back from, um, from your network with capabilities like V2G. But more specifically, um, how that kind of complements uh, V2G, V2G, V2X technology, but more specifically, how that might support the fleet market as well. So I'll just give you a little bit more insight into the Switch platform. So if you would have joined maybe our last webinar uh, last month, we went a little bit more of a deep dive into the actual platform itself. But at Switch, we've been building a platform which is native to the protocol of OCPP 2.0.1, which means that Unlike legacy 1.6 protocols and CSMSs, we are able to build a platform which is based around granularity, uh, deeper granularity and control. So as Mark mentioned, you know, the 15118 side of um, Dash 20 will obviously enable the V2X capability through, um, through V2X. But more importantly, what, what it also enables us to do is build out a, what we're calling advanced capabilities. And one of those advanced capabilities is plug and charge. So we know that the next generation of charging will need to support plug and charge. So through the combination of 2.0.1 and 15.11.8, we've been able to bring together the potential for plug and charge. But more importantly, and more specific to the OCPP 2.0.1 protocol is the granularity that you get at a per charging station level. And we've built um, a feature which we call advanced maintenance which enables a charge point operator to have a real granular view of their charging station, which we say a 360 view. So right now, if you were to have an issue with your charging station, you wouldn't be able to determine what the issue is. You'd just be able to determine that there is an issue. But with the 2.01 protocol within the switch platform, you're able to get a component level of information and a component status. And what that enables the CPO to do is not just determine if there is an issue, but also what that issue is. Um, and it's all around providing value through your network, through providing 100% charger uptime. And we know one of the biggest barriers to probably EV infrastructure adoption right now is cost and the investment in the asset, investment in the installation, the actual investment in the um, charger itself and building out that infrastructure within the CPO network. And we recognize that at Switch and in partnership with Nuve as well. And by bring, bringing together capabilities which allow you to monetize your network but also bring value back is really important. And with this particular feature of advanced maintenance, it's all around providing 100% charger uptime at any given time. So if there is an issue with your charging station, we give the data to the CPO to determine that actually that if there is an issue, we know what the issue is. So rather than having an engineer coming out twice, and first to diagnose the issue and second to actually fix it, we can provide real-time update as to what that issue is so they can pass that on to an engineer to A, get it fixed promptly so you can start to continue to generate value from that charger. But secondly, reduce the maintenance costs. Now, the next generation of that is predictive maintenance. The starting point is actually providing the component information. But what that enables us to do is um, allow predictive maintenance. So rather than being reactive when, when there's an issue, 
we we enable a CPO to be proactive when there's an issue. So um, as an example to that, a CPO might be able to determine that in two to three months time, a certain component like the fan or the liquid cooling system is going to come to its end of its life cycle. That level of information can then be passed to a, a maintenance engineer. And whenever they come to do the maintenance of the charging station, they can fix that before it becomes an issue. So it's, it's all about taking a real basic charging station CSMS into that next generation to provide capabilities that allow us to monetize on the network, but ensure that there is a hundred percent charger uptime and gather value back from the grid, uh, va va value back from your network. So in conjunction with, um, capabilities like V2G, you can create a platform that allows you to get that value back with features that complement each other. And it's all around cost efficiency, a hundred percent charger uptime, and also a future proofed fleet solution, which we think is, we know is the next generation of EV charging and bringing those two together in one place uh, will really help allow that EV infrastructure to grow. Okay, so that leads us quite nicely onto the complementary partnership between uh, Nube and Switch. So I'm just going to hand over to probably Mark and Hamza to talk a little bit more about the partnership we have between Switch and Nube. Um, yeah, so as you, as some of you may have heard, um, Switch and Nube are closely collaborating. Um, we have Nuvi on board as um, as an investor as well, and we decided to go to market together with our solutions because they are very complementary. Um, where we provide the onboard charger, uh, manage uh, sorry the the operations and management of the charging infrastructure, um, with a um, really a lot of effort put into the user, uh, the usability UX UI, and then Nuvi providing the um, expertise when it comes to vehicle to grid, um, but also dynamic load management and also the fleet uh, marketing itself. Um, Hamza, did you want to add something to that on this slide? Yeah, I would like to say we're very excited about this strategic partnership and investment, Mark. We've been working together very closely for over three years. And we really see this partnership as a change in the game in the industry really by providing the expertise from switch as it relates to the O&M and Dash 20, as well as the new V energy management piece through our gift platform. What this slide mm -hmm. covers is really the four areas that V2G and this partnership enables. First, we're increasing the utilization of the EVs and therefore reducing the TCO. We're also transforming the EVs into renew into valuable earning assets by enabling access to markets or, or saving uh, costs for the end customer. We'll also enable a more resilient grid by enabling the, uh, the stability of the grid and the integration of more renewable resources. Well, that's it. Good. Yeah, um, Adam, did you want to, I think that's a slide from, from you. Yeah. So just to build on um, what you've uh, said, Hamza, and build on what I said before, the partnership very much is complementary of each other in terms of feature set. So here you see on the left hand side, the capabilities that from a switch perspective that are native to 2.0.1 and 15.11.8 allow us to um, improve uh, interoperability through the Joseph product, which is our embedded software um, product as well. Uh, I touched before on predictive maintenance and advanced diagnostics. So being able to maximize charger uptime and generate value from your network is particularly important on this feature. Um, reporting and the ability to be notified within the platform is particularly important to both Nuve and Switch, um, but also most importantly, dynamic load management and roaming. We know, as I said before, that one of the biggest barriers is cost. Um, so we try to reduce that upfront cost by enabling dynamic load balancing within the platform itself. Now that moving with, uh, complementing with Nuve, um, you know, turnkey management solution and being able to manage uh, manage the energy through V2X integration, you all, all of a sudden created a, a much bigger and better platform um, jointly that solves the, the issue of um, cost and maximizing cost, being able to reduce that cost through um, dynamic load management, but also generating ongoing value through your network. So I think really in summary is, Switch and Nuve have come together to partner to create a platform 
that um, is focused around future proofing, but also focused around really generating that value from the network, uh, which we know is particularly important, not just for uh, bigger networks, but also smaller networks to allow them to grow uh, and increase their usage over time. So personally for me, expect, particularly from a product perspective, I'm really excited to be working with the, the Nuve team. Um, and I think we will, we will create, uh, we, I know we will create something uh, quite, quite, quite unique in the market. So we complement each other very well, I suppose, to solve real issues and real problems in the market that, that need to be addressed right now. Okay. And Hamza, if you wanted to touch on this one a little bit more. Yeah, this is just a graphic to show how we see this working. You have the switch pieces with Sarah and Joseph, Joseph being the embedded operating system from switch and Sarah being the ONM platform. Then Nuvi comes in with energy management expertise through the GIFT platform, as well as our other exciting partnership, Astra AI, which is focused on AI and machine learning for forecasting the demand as well as the, the grid conditions. Next slide. You muted Mark. Okay. <laughs> Falling into the same trap. Um, before we go into the Q&A, um, we have prepared one poll for the audience here. And um, the presenter, um, I think you will then in a second see the poll. Yeah. So it's popping up here next to the chat box. Um, and the question here is, in which areas do you think V2G has the biggest potential? Uh, is it the Dach region, which is Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the UK, the Nordics, Eastern Europe, Benelux, uh, Southern Europe, North America, South America, APEC, and Asia? So I'm quite interested in your opinions here. Seems like we already see a slight winner, a tendency towards North America, which is not surprising. And then uh, Nordics and Eastern Europe are fighting for a uh, second uh, place. Okay, so give it five more seconds. Please give you a vote. Okay, right, so not surprisingly, we see North America at the very top, um, not at least because we, uh, Nuve has been providing, uh, has been trailblazing this and uh, is based in North America, but also because the, the grid situation is slightly different in North America than it is in Europe, for example, it's a bit less stable. Um, <coughs> and also with a extreme weather conditions, this becomes a more and more severe situation where um you know i have the uh, summer wildfires where they have the rolling blackouts uh, from different utility operators and people just would like to um you know be able to power their homes uh, and not be affected by a blackout this is not v2g it's more v2 home or v2 building um but also the the opposite the the blizzard um in texas i think sometime last year or was it even two years ago um where it uh, would be great if you could have your vehicle power your home and you sit uh, warm and nice on your sofa. So having said this, I think it's time to look at the questions. Who is moderating the questions? Is it you, Adam? Or... Yeah, let's, um, let's, uh, let's start. Um, so yeah, we've got 24 questions uh, at the moment, wow. which, uh, which is great. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, so we'll go in the order of uh, which they've been voted for. So feel free just to continue to vote. Um, but we've got first question from Carl. So what do you think about the future of AC B2G? Um, well, let me start first and then I uh, hand it over to Hamza. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I do see that 
the majority of car manufacturers are focusing at the moment on, on the DC bidirectional charging. Although there are some at the moment that are already also experimenting with AC and are actually doing AC V2G. Um, that is Renault, um, that is Hyundai, that is Sona Motors. Um, when you look up uh, Utrecht and uh, We Drive Solar, there's a famous project there um, that also Robert, uh, the, the, let me, how do you pronounce his name correctly? Robert Levelin, I think. Um, from uh, Fully Charged, he has a nice episode on this Utrecht project. Very interesting. Um, so it's, there's a bit of a split between the, uh, in the OEM or car manufacturing industry. Some favor more AC, some more DC, and, and others are undecided. It's hard to say yet. I think it's, it's depending on the use case. When you look at workplace charging and at home charging, where AC charges might be still cheaper than DC when it comes to, to bi-directional charging. Um, I see it more of a use case there, whereas in, in uh, fleet charging, especially when you have um, buses and uh, heavy duty vehicles with big batteries, um, their DC V2G might be um, more of a sensible solution. But what do you think, Hansa? I think it's going to be a mix, Mark. There is definitely a use case for AC V2G. Now, there are some regulatory barriers that we're trying to overcome here and compliance with grid codes, for example. But it's really going to be driven by the uh, by the use cases of the fleets as well as the assets. So from my perspective, it will be a mix. There's definitely a place for AC V2G. A lot of OEMs are interested in it, just like you mentioned, especially on the light duty segment. Good. Next question. Okay. So we've got one from um, Forrest Williams here. So has ISO 1511-8 been reconciled with California's Title 21? Mm. So uh, I think what Forrest means is California's Rule 21. That's, that's how I know it. Um, I would like to share one slide, if I may. Yes. Um, let me see. I hope that's not... Any problem? Can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay. So there's currently a discussion going on in California, whereby um, there's this rule 21. Um, Hamza knows it way better than, than me, but um, um, that currently specifies a an IEEE standard. It is called IEEE 2030.5 formerly known as the Smart Energy Profile 2.0, which is basically a, a protocol that has been defined by the utility industry in North America. And um, that rule 21 defines, um, or that language specifies that this protocol or the capabilities provided by this protocol um, must be implemented in, in all inverters, including onboard chargers in the vehicle that are connected to the grid. However, if you read it carefully, it says uh, it, the capability must be provided, not exactly that protocol. It may be a default solution, but it doesn't exclude other protocols. So in other words, the, in, the inverter must be certified to that IEEE standard, but you may use other communication protocols in the field, such as ISO 1511A between car and charger and OCPP between charger and backend. But of course, we need OCPP to be um, compliant with the grid codes. And as I just showed you, there is a task force that is working on it at the moment. And we will, with the next version 2.1, have a version that is fully grid code compliant. So on, on this slide here, um, that is what the utility industry would like to do and love to do, directly managing a charging station. Um, however, um, I think the future is more going towards charging stations implementing the OCPP protocol and then the charging station management systems interacting with the utility via IEEE 2030.5 that is then communicating these grid codes. Hamza, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, so for 1511.8, it covers the communication between the vehicle and the AVSE, as we all know here. So in the case of a DC charging station, it doesn't matter, 1511.8-20, includes the commands that are needed since the 
grid code is really enforced by the EVSE and sits within the EVSE, can be controlled through 2030.5 or equivalent. In case of aggregators, you can be listed as a CSIP aggregator, and therefore you don't need to send those commands to the charger using 2030.5, at least as of today. Rules are changing, of course. But in the case of ACV2G, it becomes a little more complicated, especially in California and the US. There is this task force working on UL1741SC, which has multiple system types, one of which is uh, A1, which requires 2030.5 communication between the EV and EVSE. However, B1 leverages LAN communication and J3072 to pass those IEEE 1547 and 47.1 controls to the vehicles. What we're looking at now is expanding 15.11.8, and we've talked about this a little bit, Mark, to include some of those grid settings, especially for California. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you both. Um, so there's a question here from Thomas. So which countries are ready to make money with grid services already, and which ones will follow next? Perhaps maybe Parf, you wanted to maybe take this one um, based on the examples you showed early in the presentation? Yeah, sure. So I can go first and then Hamza can chime in. So yeah. based on the current uh, market uh, dynamics, I think the Nordics or the Scandinavia uh, has been op like we have, we are running commercial fleets uh, over there and they've been operation operational for a long time. So that's where, you know, we can provide these services like frequency containment reserves, and then um, there is also so these are like ancillary services there is also scope for let's say flexibility services uh, so we are we have some operations in spain and portugal where we are doing you know um, demand charge management and and these kind of services uh, to provide flexibility to the grid and then here in the north america we have programs both in california as well as in new england region where there are programs like let's say bring your own device or connected solution where there are you know scheduled discharges that we can do and participate in the market so the market is opening up and surely b2g is has a great potential but yeah hamza would you like to add in yeah just to add to what uh, part said the ancillary services exist everywhere it's about market access for b2g and vehicles and that's why our regulatory group is working on every day to really enable those markets for V2G. But FCR exists all across Europe. Now in Spain and Portugal, the market access is not as easy as it is in France, for example, where our Drive joint venture is performing FCR. Then in the US, we've been performing regul Regulation D or Regulation in PJM, as well as in California, we've had a couple of pilots to provide regulation, but a lot of the services that we see in the US are targeted at the distribution level and that touches on some of the programs that Bart mentioned. And then once you go to the UK, they're more interested in local flexibility services, but the markets are there. It's all about access and the answer is today. You can access a lot of those markets today. Great. Thank you, Hamza. So I'm also just conscious of time um, as well. So and we've got a lot of questions, which is great. Uh, so maybe I suggest we do one more um, and then maybe on the top questions, one or two more, maybe and as a top question, maybe as a team, we can answer those offline as part of the blog notes, potentially that will follow up this. Um, at least we'll get some answers on those if that's, if that's all right. Um, so we've got one question here from Dave, uh, particularly to Nuve. So what are the communication links that Nuve use in its V2G pilots? Um, how much does that cost per month and what percentage uptime does that provide? So yes, Nuve does pilot, but Nuve is also commercial. We've been providing these services commercially. What communication we use with the uh, assets or the infrastructure that we see it, we tend to push for LAN connection. We find it more reliable. However, we have fallbacks for for Wi-Fi as well as cellular. The uptime we've achieved varies by region, but it's over 99% on average. And uh, the cost I'll have to check, but it also varies per region. We're looking at 
less than $10 per charger for LTE-enabled devices because we really work on optimizing the communication between the charger and the cloud. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Hamza. Um, time for one more? Okay. Yeah, we have time for, I would say like five past four. Um, okay. That's like four more minutes. I think time for one more question. Okay, no worries. Let's, uh, let's keep going down the list. So there's one here from Carl. Um, so is ISO 1511-8-20 compatible or does it conflict with the development of J3072 plus UL1741 SC in the in California? Maybe I can take this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we've touched on it a little bit. 1741 SC as of today does not specify uh, 1511.8, but we're looking at extensions that are needed for 1511.8-20 to be in line with 1741 SC. At the end of the day, it's about communicating the uh, the settings and information between the charger and the and the uh, EV. So I don't see many conflicts. I see some gaps in dash 20 that need to be filled. Of course, the uh, task force for SC has not considered 1511.8-20, but I'm sure in the next revisions, they will consider it, especially with the push in the US for ISO 1511.8 really from an interall perspective. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Good. Yeah, I think this concludes our webinar. Um, as I mentioned, the webinar is available as a recording using the same link. So whenever you feel like it, um, revisit that link and then you can um, dive into the details, which may have been a bit too, too hard to grasp at times. Um, but I hope it was very useful. Um, there is a link at the very bottom if you want to learn more or um, learn more about our products. Um, and then you can uh, click at the link at the bottom there. You can book a meeting with us. Um, other than that, um, thanks a lot that there were so many people joining this webinar and for these great uh, questions. Sorry for not being able to answer every, every question, but um, we will do our best to answer them afterwards, um, either in a blog post or um, if you write us. Um, and then I think if you have, if you show the last slide of the um, presentation, there is contact information as well. There you see Hamza's or my email address, so you can always write us. Um, but I'll type it maybe in the chat if. We need I'll, I'll pop it into the chat. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thanks for joining and see you next time and have a great summer vacation wherever you might be. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.